بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله تعالى today we have another episode or another segment of our Friday night reflections uh, remind us, inshallah. For today, we're talking about the topic of the Muslim woman. And I'm going to talk about this topic in light of various ayat and ahadith. And these ayat and ahadith give us information which is important to both men and women. It's important to women because it relates to them. And these are ayat and ahadith that relate to women. And it's important for men because it helps us to understand how we should treat the women around us and the rulings relating to that. And as a man, you are often responsible for the women folk in your family. For example, you're responsible for your wife, you're responsible for your daughters. In that case, you need to be aware of issues relating to the halal and the haram and issues relating to advice given to women so that you are able to exercise your responsibility properly. You're able to fulfill your responsibility as someone who is responsible usually for various uh, women folk in your family. So therefore it's important, very very important that you understand issues relating to and advice relating to the Muslim woman so that you can go and advise your wives and your sisters and your daughters and so on and for the sisters themselves so that they can understand some of the responsibilities of the Muslim woman some of the dangers in this time some of the things the Prophet wasallam advised and so I'm just going to select and, and I'm not going to by any means select every hadith on the topic I'm going to select a few ayat and a few hadith and from them explore some of the topics which are important around this around this uh, this issue of muslim women and i think it's particularly relevant in our time because we see that there is a a huge effort being made by the enemies of islam by those people who want to extinguish the light of allah azza wa jal to attack the Muslim woman not so much physically as attacking her through shubuhat wa shahawat through doubts and misconceptions telling her that you don't have to do this and you don't have to do that and this is not obligatory and you shouldn't do until she becomes confused about what Allah Azza wa Jal wants her to do and through shahawat, by appealing to her desire. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, but just to give you an example. Every woman wants to look beautiful. Every woman wants to look beautiful. Every woman wants to look her best. And so the shaitan wants to appeal to the Muslim woman when she goes out to decorate her hijab and to make herself look very very beautiful because this is naturally appealing to her in herself and so the shaitan appeals to her desires and there is a huge effort from shayateen al-ins wal-jinn from the shayateen of the jinn and the men to attack the foundation of our Ummah, the thing which holds us together in terms of the Muslim, our Muslim women 
our mothers, our daughters, our sisters, our wives. Because the shayateen from the jinn and the men, they know that if they achieve this, then they will have weakened the men and the women in a very severe way, in a way that is very, very strong and in a way that is very effective to achieve their aims. And this being, you know, and anyone who sort of is keeping up to date with, with what is going on in the world today can see the amount of effort that is being put into a sustained attack against the values that practicing Muslim women hold and trying to prevent them from their religion in things that men are not prevented from. And you only have to see in the West and particularly in Western Europe the efforts to ban the hijab. None of them want to ban the beard. None of them want to ban your thiyab from being above your ankles. Their efforts are towards attacking the Muslim woman. Because it serves their aims in weakening the Muslims and it serves their desires in being able to see the women wearing what they desire the women to wear. And so they, for example, tell the woman, you are free to wear nothing, but you're not free to cover yourself. If you cover yourself, you'll be fined or imprisoned. But if you wear nothing, this is your freedom. And so ultimately, we have to respond to that by educating ourselves, men and women, about what Allah Azza wa Jal requires from our Muslim sisters and from men with regard to our the Muslim women that we encounter and how we should go about raising our Iman and increasing our Iman with the permission of Allah to such an extent that we can withstand these kind of attacks which are being made, these kind of ideological attacks against uh, the women in our, in our community, in our religion, in our society. So a number of ahadith and ayat, and by the, like I said, we, we, we're not by no means covering everything. I'm just picking some things that I wanted to talk about. So I want to start with a, an ayah, which I think just sets the tone of what we want to achieve today. In Surah At-Tawbah, ayah number 71, Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ وَيُطِيعُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ أُولَٰئِكَ سَيَرْحَمُهُمُ اللَّهُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ Allah Azza wa Jal said, The believing men and the believing women are allies to one another. They are awliya. They support one another. They help one another. They command that which is good. And they forbid that which is evil. And they perform the prayer. And they give their zakah. And they obey Allah and His Messenger. It is they whom Allah will have mercy upon. And Allah is the Almighty and All Wise. This for me sets the tone of our mentality in terms of what we want to achieve today. And how we should, we should approach the issue of the Muslim woman. We don't approach the issue of the Muslim woman as a man pointing my finger and sitting on an ivory tower and looking down and saying, you know, you should do this and you should do this and you should do this. But from the point of view of helping one another, they are helpers, they are the ones who are allies to one another. They tell each other to do what is good. And the women tell the men to do what is good and the men tell the women to do what is good. And the men tell the women to stop doing what is wrong and the women tell the men to stop doing what is wrong. And they encourage each other with regard to the prayer and giving the zakah and obeying Allah and His Messenger. And notice how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned these things in which men and women are both have a share in doing these actions. In commanding good, in forbidding evil, in performing the prayer, in giving the zakah, in obeying Allah and His Messenger. And notice that Allah Azza wa Jal 
emphasizes the obedience to Allah and His Messenger. And I don't want any woman who hears this to think that this is a man telling you what to do. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is commanding you and He knows what is best. Doesn't the one who created know? Because again, one of the shubuhat, one of the, the misconceptions and the, and the evil notions that they, the non-Muslims put out is they say, why are you letting these men tell you what to do? Take back your freedom. Take back your ability to decide for yourself. This is not about a man telling a woman what to do. This is about all of us getting near to Allah Azza wa Jal. Every man and every woman is commanded to obey Allah and obey His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah is the Creator and He knows what will correct His creation. We don't know what's good for us. Wallahi, we don't know what's good for us. We think something is good for us and later on we find it's not good for you. We think that such and such a thing will be beneficial and later on we find it wasn't beneficial. Allah Azza wa Jal knows what is good for us. He knows what will correct us. It's not about men telling women or lecturing to women what they should do. But it's about obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal and all of us encouraging each other to obey Allah. And this removes the shubha, the doubt that why are you listening to a man telling you how to behave? Why are you allowing them to dictate to you what you should and shouldn't be doing? We say to those people, you have misunderstood. We are not here to get points over one another that I am in control of you and I'm responsible and I tell you and you don't tell me. That's not the mentality. The mentality is we are here to help each other to obey Allah Azza wa Jal. Yes, some of us are responsible for others. We will come to this. Some of us are responsible for others. That's normal human society. Everybody has a boss at work. All of us have people responsible for other people. But ultimately, what it matters or what we are talking about here today is obedience to Allah and obedience to His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is commanded for men and commanded for women. And women's role is to do everything they can to help themselves and to help the men in their family to obey Allah and to obey His Messenger. And a man's role is to do everything that he can to help himself and the women in his family to obey Allah and to obey His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And even if you as a man or a woman don't understand the benefit in something, Maybe for example, you don't fully understand why it is that women are required to wear the hijab and men are not required to wear the hijab. That is something that comes with knowledge. People of knowledge understand why. However, maybe at a certain point somebody comes, especially a new Muslim or newly practicing Muslim and says, I don't really understand that. We say that ultimately understanding it is not as important as recognizing that it is a command that came from Allah and Allah knows best what is going to correct our society and ourselves. It's not a requirement that I should understand the illa, the reason for every ruling in Islam. If I understand the reason, alhamdulillah. And if I don't understand the reason that I know it is from, Hakim in Khabir, from the most wise and the one who knows and is aware of everything. And that if he decrees something for me, it's going to be best for me. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun. Allah knows, i.e., Allah knows what is best for you. Because this ayah talks about you loving something and hating when it's good, when it's, it's bad for you, and hating something when it's good for you. And then Allah said, Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun. Allah knows what is good for you. And you don't know what's good for you. So ultimately, even if you don't understand some of the rulings we're going to mention today, 
What you have to understand is that these rulings came from or come from Allah and from His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And therefore, we obey even if we have yet to understand the reason or the wisdom behind it. And if we understand the wisdom, that makes us even stronger. And I'll do my best to explain in my limited, according to my limited ability, some of the wisdoms behind these rulings today. However, ultimately, once we recognize that a ruling comes from Allah and His Messenger, Allah Azza wa Jal told us, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ It's not for a believing man or a believing woman. Neither men nor male nor female. If Allah and His Messenger decide or decree or legislate a matter, that they should have any choice in it. You don't have a choice. As Allah Azza wa Jal said in another ayah, that they submit to it with complete submission. What you sallimu taslima, they submit to it completely. Because we are Muslim. What does the word Muslim mean? Somebody who submits to Allah, male and female. We submit to Allah. Meaning we submit to what Allah has legislated for us in Islam. The rules and the regulations and the laws that Allah has decreed for us in Islam, we submit to them. Because we know that Allah Azza wa Jal knows what is best for us and we have submitted to Him in Islam. And therefore, when Allah decrees something, we don't have a choice to say, I think, or I believe, or my opinion is, or my position is. None of these words should come from the mouth of a man or a woman who believes in Allah after they are sure that the command came from Allah. You don't have al khiyara you don't have a choice after that. And whoever disobeys Allah and His Messenger has indeed gone far astray. So this is kind of to set the, the intention behind what we're trying to, or to set an introduction to what we're trying to, to say. The first ayah in terms of the topic at hand that I want to deal with is an ayah in Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 36. Allah Azza wa Jal is talking about the mother of Maryam alayhi salam, the wife of Imran. And Allah Azza wa Jal said, فَلَمَّا وَضَعَتْهَا قَالَتْ رَبِّ إِنِّي وَضَعْتُهَا أُنْثَى وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا وَضَعَتْ وَلَيْسَ الذَّكَرُ كَالْأُنْثَى وَإِنِّي سَمَّيْتُهَا مَرْيَمْ وَإِنِّي أُعِيذُهَا بِكَ وَذُرِّيَّتَهَا مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Allah Azza wa Jal said the translation of which is When she gave birth to her She said, My Lord, I have given birth to a female What is the meaning of this? She had sworn She had sworn to Allah Azza wa Jal that she would offer her child in service to the place of worship. She had promised to Allah that she would offer her child in service to the place of worship. She said, رَبِّ إِنِّي نَذَرْتُ لَكَ مَا فِي بَطَنِي مُحَرَّرًا فَتَقَبَّلْ مِنِّي O oh Allah, I pledge to you whatever is in my womb as a service for you, as a servant, to be a servant for you. And it seems that this was one of the acts of worship that was within the sharia of the people who came before us. That a woman could pledge her child in service to the place of worship what they called the, the temple or whatever, they could offer their child and, and particularly a male child. And she was expecting that child to be a male. And when she gave birth to a female, she said, my Lord, I have given birth to a female. Meaning this is not what I was expecting. I was expecting to give birth to a boy and the boy will grow up to be in service of the, the place of worship. However, when it was a girl, this was more difficult. 
So she said, I've given birth to a female. And Allah knew better what she had given birth to. And then Allah says, and this is the shahid from the ayah that I want, وَلَيْسَ الذَّكَرُ كَالْأُنثَى Males are not like females. This is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is not the statement of the wife of Imran. Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَلَيْسَ الذَّكَرُ كَالْأُنثَى Males are not like females. And this is the first point that we want to put across. That in Islam, men and women have different needs. What we're going to hear in the next hadith or ayat is that those needs are many times the same. But ultimately, we have to recognize that men and women are not the same. And this is in response to the shubha of Western feminism. And I say Western feminism because not even Eastern feminism fell into this. And this is primarily Western feminism, which is the belief that women should be men. If you want me to define, I define Western feminism as the belief that a woman should be a man. And that she's not being given her rights until she is a man. And that's not what Islam says. Islam says men and women are different. They're different in creation. They're different in much of their character and temperament. They're different in what Allah Azza wa Jal has obliged them to do in many cases. So we have to learn to love and appreciate those differences. Not to fight against them. Because one of the things that the Western, Western feminism is teaching us to do, is particularly teaching our women to do. And bear in mind, not all Western feminism comes from women who are kafirat, who are disbelievers. And some of it sadly comes from women wearing hijab. And perhaps I can tell you that one of the worst and most staunch feminists who caused so much she caused so much facade on the earth and she was in my city in Newcastle and she caused so much facade on the earth so much corruption and yet she was a Muslim a Muslim woman so don't think that all of them I'm talking about the non-Muslim women I'm talking about also the Muslim women who try unfortunately have fell into the error of serving this cause of Western feminism of teaching the women that you don't have your rights until you can be a man. But Islam tells you that men and women are different and we should appreciate and we should learn to love and respect the differences that exist between men and women. And that, interestingly enough, is the position of many Eastern feminists. And I'm not a fan of feminism or whatever the masculine equivalent is in any case. But many feminists from the East said that feminism should be giving the woman the freedom to be a woman. Whereas in the West they said it should be giving the woman freedom to be a man. So even feminists, even staunch feminists among themselves, even some of them say that we should learn to love and respect the differences that exist between men and women. And this is the nature, this is the, the fitrah. The natural inclination that men are men and women are women. And it's getting to a crazy degree. You know, what we thought was, was uh, you know, we thought that the issue had reached its peak in terms of what people would do in terms of this uh, pushing, pushing uh, women to be like men. And subhanAllah, the issue became much worse in the past years where now young children young children are being gender reassigned and they're having their gender changed when they're small children because why their teacher tells them actually you're not a female you're a male and it's forcing them yeah and he's forcing them to to uh, change their gender and now there is a big push for example to remove 
yani in the West, particularly in the United States and, and somewhat in other countries, to remove male and female bathrooms. And to allow males and females that they use the same, the same bathroom. Because of this constant push to eradicate any difference between men and women. Whereas Allah Azza wa Jal tells us, وَلَيْسَ الذَّكَرُ كَالْأُنْثَى Men are not like women. They're not the same. So don't treat them the same. Learn to respect and appreciate the differences that exist between men and between women. Having said that, my next point is, don't exaggerate these differences. Why? Because the Prophet wasallam uh, or it is reported that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said إِنَّمَا النِّسَاءُ شَقَائِقُ الرِّجَالِ Women are the full sisters of men. In other words, what the scholars take from this hadith is that all of the rulings that apply to men apply to women except where there is a clear dalil. And when Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُ الزَّكَاةَ Those of you who know Arabic, aqimu is the masculine plural. And all you men perform the prayer. However, the masculine plural in Arabic encompasses the feminine as well. But we want to establish a principle here. Everything in the Quran is targeted at men and women equally, except where there is a clear dalil. And sometimes there's a clear evidence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks directly to the men or speaks directly to the women or uses the, the feminine plural or it relates to an issue that only affects women or an issue that only affects men. However, the vast majority of the Quran and the Sunnah is aimed at men and women equally because women are the full sisters of men. Shaqa'iqur rijal and they're not like, you know, like some like lower second class citizen, you know, like that is just like the, the, the outcast or the offcast, you know, like the waste product. They are the full sisters of men and the rulings of Islam apply to them as they apply to men. So when Allah Azza wa Jal commands you to say, وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي ilma," O my Lord, increase me in knowledge, this applies to women and it applies to men when allah azza wa jal says wa aqimu salata wa atu zakah perform the prayer and give the zakah this applies to women and it applies to men when allah azza wa jal says ya ayyuhan nas u'budu rabbakum o mankind worship your lord this applies to women and it applies to men when allah azza wa jal promises you jannat tajri min tahtiha al-anhar Paradise under which rivers flow, gardens under which rivers flow. This applies to women and it applies to men. The only thing that don't that doesn't apply to one gender apart from the other is when there is an evidence to restrict it to a particular gender. And there are some issues that are restricted to particular genders in Islam. There are some things that are unique to men and some things that are unique to women. But in general, the rulings that are given to men are the same rulings that are given to women. And this is the balance in Islam. It's beautiful, it's a balance. Islam says, look, men and women mostly need the same things. And so the commands that are given to men and women are the same. But when there is a need to be different because they are different from one another, then Islam will give a different ruling for men and a different ruling for women. But the basic principle, the underlying fundamental principle is an nisa'u shaqa'iqur rijal. 
women are the full counterparts, the full sisters, and the full, fully, you know, fully, uh, all of the laws of Islam apply to them fully as they apply to men, unless there is an evidence to restrict it to one or to the other. And now we move on to an ayah in Surah An-Nisa. And I think this ayah is probably one of the most important things that we're going to talk about today. And if you understand it correctly, it destroys almost all of the shubuhat that are spread around the Muslim woman and almost all of the attacks that are spread against the Muslim woman to push her away from Islam. It's ayah number 32 in Surah An-Nisa. Allah Azza wa Jalla said, وَلَا تَتَمَنَّوْ مَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ بَعْضَكُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ لِلْرِّجَالِ نَصِيبٌ مِّمَّا اكْتَسَبُوا وَلِلنِّسَاءِ نَصِيبٌ مِّمَّا اكْتَسَبْ وَاسْأَلُوا اللَّهَ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمًا Allah Azza wa Jalla said, Do not seek that which Allah has preferred some of you in over others. So point number one, Allah has preferred many of His creation over other people in His creation in many different things. Let me take a non, or not non-controversial, but a, a less controversial issue and talk about lineage. Does anyone doubt that the best lineage is Bani Hashim? And that the best lineage moving out further is Quraysh? And that the best lineage moving out further are the Arabs? There's no doubt about this. Allah has preferred people from Bani Hashim over people who are not from Bani Hashim in lineage. I'm not from Bani Hashim. I'm not from Quraysh, nor am I from the Arabs. I should not be upset that Allah Azza wa Jal has preferred them over me in that particular aspect. That does not mean that everyone from Bani Hashim will be above everyone else in Jannah. Rather, some of Bani Hashim are in the lowest of Jahannam. As Allah Azza wa Jal said, Tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tab. And Abu Lahab, who is in among the worst of the people of Jahannam, is from the best of the people in lineage. You almost cannot get anybody closer to the Prophet ﷺ in lineage. So there are things which Allah has preferred some of us over in, as opposed to others. For example, in strength. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us the Prophet ﷺ said, Al Mu'min al Qawi khayrun wa ahabbu ila Allah min al Mu'min al Da'if wa fi kullin khayr. The strong believer is better and more beloved to Allah than the weak believer. And yes, the, the hadith primarily talks about strength of determination and strength of iman and other things. However, the hadith also encompasses physical strength. Allah Azza wa Jal has preferred physical strength over physical weakness. But if Allah hasn't given you physical strength, don't sit there thinking, why has this person been preferred over me? Allah Azza wa Jal has given you what He has not given them, and given them what He has not given you. And all of you have an opportunity to earn what is with Allah Azza wa Jal. So we need to understand that Allah Azza wa Jal gives virtues to whoever He wants and takes them away from whoever He wants. And in, if you lost a virtue in something, you gained a virtue in something else. Maybe you are not from Quraysh, but maybe your manners and your etiquettes and your character is better than many of the people who are from Quraysh. Maybe you are not physically strong, but you are strong in your in your iman or strong in your determination maybe you know you are not wealthy but you have the ability to for example give sadaqah in other ways you're a person who finds it easy to do the dhikr of allah allah azza wa jal has preferred some of us over others in different things all of us men women 
you know, uh, adults, children, Allah Azza wa Jal has preferred many of us over others. And this is something we need to get used to and not fight against. And you know, a woman could, you know, can, uh, could fight and say, and this ayah is related specifically regarding the men and the women. The women could, you know, the woman she could say, but why has Allah done this? Why has Allah given this to the men? Why has Allah given authority over me to the men? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you what He has not given to many of the men. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to some of us what He has not given to others in many things, many, many things. So we have to recognize that and we have to appreciate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given some virtues to some people over others. And we should not be seeking out why have I not been given this? And this is the first sign of illness, sickness, sickness in the hearts. When you look at what Allah has given somebody else and you say, why have I not been given this? I should have been put in authority. I should be the one in charge. I should be the one who's been given this. I should be the one from this lineage. I should be the one with this power. I should be the one with this wealth. Respect the fact that Allah has given every person what is suited to them. And don't try to wrestle it from somebody else. Then Allah Azza wa Jal says specifically regarding men and women. Men have a share of what they have earned. And women have a share of what they have earned. And so if Allah has preferred men over women in a particular aspect like authority, if Allah has preferred men over women in a particular thing like authority, then do not fear because the chance of reward is equal. The chance of attaining paradise is equal. There will be women who are far, 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 far above us in paradise, qat'an, yani guaranteed without any doubt. Like the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the pious women mentioned in the Quran like Maryam alayhi salam and Asiya and others. Ultimately, they will be far above our level in paradise without any doubt. We don't have any doubt in this whatsoever. And they have been promised paradise by Allah Azza wa Jal. So we, the fact that they were women and the fact that men had authority over them did not stop them from earning the highest part of paradise. So why should we be worried about what differences we have between us in the dunya when our chance to earn reward is the same? Men have a chance to earn reward. Women have a chance to earn reward. They may earn reward in different ways. A woman may earn reward by obeying her husband. A man may earn reward by being gentle to his wife. But ultimately your opportunities are there for men and are there for women. And that's what really matters. Equal opportunities for paradise. That's what really matters. And they always talk about equal opportunities for men and women. But what really matters is equal opportunities for paradise, not equal opportunities in the dunya. Because Allah Azza wa Jal has preferred some of us over others in the dunya. Many of us over others. There are people far more knowledgeable than me. Allah has preferred them over me in the dunya. Everyone has a chance to earn paradise. Men, women, rich, poor, whatever you are, however Allah has given you strong, weak, whether you are from the best lineage or the worst lineage, Allah Azza wa Jal has given you an opportunity to earn paradise. And that's what really matters in terms of equality between men and women. That we've been given an opportunity, all of us, to earn paradise. If it were the case that Allah said, all of the men are in the higher parts of paradise, and all of the women are in the lowest parts of paradise, then this would be zulm. This would be oppressive. This would be unequal. This would be unfair. 
But as for Allah Azza wa Jal saying, men, you're responsible for women in this dunya. But your wife may be far above you in Jannah and maybe you will be raised up in paradise as a gift to her because of her Iman. She may be far above you in Jannah. She may be far more beloved to Allah than you are. She may be from the awliya of Allah, from the beloved servants of Allah. And you may be from, you know, the minimum standard of the Muslims. It doesn't matter that you've been given a degree of authority over her in this dunya. What matters is that you have the opportunity and the chance to earn reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to earn paradise. And in this, being a woman doesn't hold her back from earning paradise. And being a man doesn't hold you back. And being, from a, being a non-Arab doesn't hold you back from earning paradise. So don't worry about the things that Allah has said, this is better than this, or this is preferred over this, or this is responsible for this, or this one is in charge of this one. None of this matters. What matters is the opportunity to earn paradise. And ultimately, all of us are servants of Allah. All of us are servants of Allah. Whatever stage you reach of being in control of, you know, half of the world, you are still Abdullah. You are still a servant of Allah Azza wa Jal. And you're still required to obey Allah and obey His Messenger and you still put your forehead on the ground in submission to Allah Azza wa Jal. وَاسْأَلُوا اللَّهَ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ And then, instead of wishing for what someone else has, instead of a woman sitting there and wishing she could be a man, ask Allah for His virtue. Ask Allah to give you Jannah al firdaus Ask Allah to make it easy to obey Him. Ask Allah to make you from the 70,000 who will enter Jannah without any punishment or any reckoning. Ask Allah from His virtue. Why sit there thinking about what somebody else got instead of just asking Allah, Oh Allah, give me what I want. Give me this, give me this, give me this. The sensible person is the person who is focused on asking Allah for what benefits them. And the person who is, lo is lost is the person who spends all their time instead of asking Allah for what will benefit them, they spend their whole time wishing they could be somebody else. Don't wish you could be somebody else. Men or women, don't sit here wishing you could be somebody else. Accept what Allah has given you and ask Allah to give you what you want. Indeed, Allah is in every single thing knowledgeable. Allah knows every single thing. He knows what you want. He knows what you hope for. He knows your dreams. He knows what you ask for. He knows what is best for you and what is easiest for you to achieve, for you to achieve paradise. I might have to divide this topic into two parts if we're not going very fast at the moment, but never mind. Let's see, inshallah. <coughs> Moving on to something different. We're going to talk about uh, a hadith narrated by Imam Muslim in Kitab al Raqaiq or Al Riqaq, and either the uh, the book of the heart softness. <coughs> From the hadith of Usama ibn Zayd radiallahu anhuma that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said ma taraktu ba'di fitnatan hiya adarru ala al-rijali min al-nisa he said I have not left after me a trial more harmful to men than women. And I think this hadith is one of the important hadith we have to talk about when it comes to the interaction between men and women. That the interaction between men and women, it can be very, very, very harmful. And the Prophet ﷺ left many fitan, yani many fitan will come after the, came after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, many trials and tribulations. And yet the Prophet ﷺ said, I have not left after me a trial more harmful to men than women. 
And this has therefore a responsibility upon men and upon women. This hadith has, has a resp- informs us of a responsibility that exists for both men and for women from the point of view of not being a trial for one another not becoming a fitna for one another and this is a responsibility for men and it's a responsibility for women so it's a responsibility for men that they don't put themselves in such a position that they allow a woman to become a fitna for them a trial for them a trial for them in their religion where perhaps they would leave some of what Allah made obligatory or they would do some of what Allah made haram for the sake of a woman and from the point of view of the women that the women don't allow themselves to become a trial for the men either in the way that they carry themselves the way that they speak the way that they dress the way that they interact with men so men and women have a responsibility about this hadith this hadith is not a criticism of women this hadith is a khabar, khabar al-waqi'. It's telling you the reality. It's not a hadith which is critical of women. And many of these ahadith are misunderstood. And they're taken to be critical of women. This hadith is not critical of women. This hadith is telling us something which is a reality. The reality is that women are very harmful to men if proper restrictions and proper guidelines are not followed and they can cause a man to go very far astray and cause themselves to go very far astray because and it should be no surprise that from the natural nature that Allah has created us with is that men are attracted to women and women are attracted to men Men find women attractive and women find men attractive. And because of this, Islam puts so many restrictions and so many rules and so many etiquettes in place to protect men and women from the dangers that can happen because of this natural attraction that exists. And this covers everything from, you know, this is enough as a proof For everything from prohibiting free mixing between men and women to the proof of the hijab to the proof of the way that we interact when we speak to one another to the proof of you know many many rules and regulations in Islam can be summarized by this that there is a danger in women becoming a trial for men and so men are commanded not to put themselves in a position where they become a trial or they allow themselves to become tried or to become in a state where they would disobey Allah because of a woman and likewise the opposite that the woman doesn't let herself become in a state where she allows herself to become a trial for a man and that is because of the natural attraction that exists between them and also the love that exists between them because also it doesn't only apply to uh, extra marital relations as in you know men and women being attracted outside of marriage even in marriage a man might disobey Allah Azza wa Jal because of the love that he has for his wife and there are many examples of, of this that a man might disobey Allah Azza wa Jal because of the love that he has for his wife but definitely in terms of the you know the the history of mankind and the nature of mankind you can see the trial that exists between men and women and that islam put so many sensible restrictions in place to make sure that these things do not become a problem and they do not harm either the men in the society or either the women in the society and so there are a few things that we wanted to talk about uh, in this regard One is the uh, statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam regarding Al-Khalwa 
regarding al khalwa la la yakhluwanna rajulun bimra'atin illa kana thalithuhum ash-shaytan no man is alone with a woman except that the third of them is the shaytan no man is alone with a woman except that the third of them is the shaytan the meaning of this is a man who is not allowed to be alone with that woman for example she he is not a mahram for her he's not her husband he's not her brother he's not her father and so when he is alone with that woman in khalwa where they where they are they are in a private sitting the shaytan is the third one of them this is a case of where the the trial comes up and it becomes very prevalent so this is another evidence for prohibiting free mixing and just being too free among men and women and women sitting along with men who are not their mahram and so on and this hadith is also mentioned in context of the brother-in-law the Prophet ﷺ told us that the in-law is death. Al-Hamu, Al-Maut. The in-law is death. Meaning the brother-in-law or the one similar to the brother-in-law, the brother-in-law or, you know, the one who is, as a relative, is very, very close to you. As a relative is very close to you. But... In terms of the, the Islamic relationship, there is no prohibitive, I mean, there is no mahram relationship. Like the brother-in-law, like for the man, the sister-in-law. And like the, you know, for example, the, the aunties, uh, the, the aunt's uh, husband, and, and you know, so on and so forth. Yani. That those people who are non-mahram, but they are very close to you in, in lineage or in marriage those people are the biggest danger and sadly we have a problem in our society we have a difficulty in our society and the difficulty that we have is that it has become common to be relaxed about those things so the lady she might wear full hijab proper hijab and she may observe that proper hijab as she should be doing with everyone except for her brother-in-law with her brother-in-law, she relaxes it. Maybe she doesn't wear it as completely as she would with other people. She kind of talks very freely. She laughs and jokes, even though in front of other men, she lowers her gaze and she covers herself completely. So Islam tells us that the, where is the danger? Where does the danger lie? The danger lies in the ones who are closest to us, but are still not permitted. We are not permitted to mix with them. So it's very important from this, you know, I don't personally, I, I strongly recommend that people don't live in a family environment where they are living, where the woman is living in the same house as a non-mahram man, except when the house is, is, if the house is very, very large and it's possible to completely, you know, separate it. In general, it's not from the sunnah. This is not from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to live with the you know the the husband's uh, parents and then the brother husband's brothers are in the same house and they mix with one another this is a big big danger and it's a big trial so we have to do things to help each other out of this situation because we are awliya to one another we're helpers to one another so we have to help each other we have to help each other not to get ourselves into these situations whereby either we put our female uh, the people we're responsible for among our female relatives in a situation where they are forced to mix with male relatives that are not their, not their mahram, and likewise that women don't put themselves into these situations. And when we're going to come to talk about the hijab, and I think probably I'm going to divide this talk into two parts and, and we'll, we'll continue it on next time because I think we've already been talking enough and we still haven't even covered half of the ahadith and the ayat that I wanted to cover. But before we talk about hijab as a, as a dress, I want to also talk about hijab as a concept, i.e. the way that you carry yourself in the way you deal with the opposite gender. And I mean this also uh, by extension to the men as well. The way that you deal with 
the opposite gender. How do you deal with people of the opposite gender? You can prevent yourself from getting into fitna with the help of Allah. And you can prevent yourself from being a fitna with the help of Allah. By the way that you set out your stall, the way you set yourself out, the way you behave, the signals, the body language that you give off. Very, very different when a woman comes to speak to you, you put your head down and you just speak to her the minimum necessary to fulfill the purpose. She comes and says, I wanted to ask you a question. Go ahead. She asks a question, you're looking at the ground. She gets a signal, there's a body language signal going on there that look, there's a barrier between us. Take what you need, the question or the issue you have or the work you need to do and go. She understands that and you understand it. Whereas when you stare into her eyes and smile at her and ask her, how have you been and how are things and how was everything last week and I hope you're well. and You allow yourself to put yourself in a situation where you expose yourself to fitna. If it doesn't happen one time, then there's no guarantee that it will not happen the next time and the next time. And likewise, the ladies, when you communicate with a man, you communicate with him in a professional way to the minimum extent necessary, even the brother-in-law. Do you need him to get something from the kitchen? Do you please get me this? Give it, khalas, go. There's no need for a long, smiley, happy, jokey conversation. You can leave those happy, jokey, smiley conversations to have with husband and wife. And one of the saddest thing is, that so many of us don't behave that way with our wives. Any to put it in a maybe in a way people might understand better. Any we don't flirt with our wives and we flirt with women that are not our wives. Allahumma Any we don't behave gently and softly and lovingly and caringly and playfully with our with our wives, but we behave in this way with women who are of no relation to us. So when our wife asks for something, don't talk to me. Don't ask me this. I'm busy. And when a woman who is Ajnabiya, she's a foreign woman, she comes and he looks her in the eyes and he's like, what do you need? And look at how we've, we've become the other way around. So don't make ourselves a fitna. The ladies, the way you deal with a man, the way you behave, the way you carry yourself, the way you speak, the body language that you give off, the way that the dress that you wear, all of it sends a signal. And that's why when we come to the hijab, and I'm going to talk more about hijab next time, it's a big topic. But when we talk about the hijab, what did Allah say? <laughs> this is better for them to be known. And yani the hijab sends out a signal. It's a message, it's a great big sign that says, I am a Muslim woman who deserves respect for who I am. There are limits with the way that you deal with me. This hijab is one of the limits. And there are plenty of other limits as well. It sends that message out to the men. And the man understands. He understands that the woman who dresses provocatively is sending a message. We're not going to say, what, you know, this issue of being blameworthy or not for what happens to her. It's not the issue here. But it, the way people dress, it sends a message. The way people sit, sends a message. The way people talk, sends a message. So make sure the messages you are sending to members who are of the opposite gender, who are not mahram, you're not mahram to them or they're not mahram to you, is the right one. And it's one of dealing with things to the minimum necessary, professionally, appropriately, without looking, without small talk, without flirting, without all of those things that people engage in. Just like you would go into, you know, like you would go into a, I don't know, into a bank or something and you see the guy behind the desk and you say to him like, I came to withdraw some money, I want to withdraw 1,000 dirhams. Okay, what's your sign here please? Okay, gone. You know, you don't stand, stare the guy in the eyes and say, how are you? You know, you're okay, I haven't seen for... Like this is something you just deal with people on a professional level. And that's the way that you need to make sure that the interaction happens between people who are of the opposite gender and leave the romantic behavior and the you know the playfulness and the you know between the husband and between the wife and leave your kind of friendliness and kindness to the women who you are there mahram and likewise the same goes for the sisters so this is just uh, I mean, a few points to be honest 
uh, I don't know if there's anything else that I wanted to uh, uh, to deal with. Uh, no, I think I think there are three or four points. Uh, there is only one point that I'm going to mention left, uh, and that is uh, hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha. I'm going to quote the hadith from Sahih Muslim, although it's in other it's in other books of hadith as well. And it's a long hadith, but at the end of the hadith, something very very beautiful that Aisha radiallahu anha said. She said, She said, Ni'man nisa'u nisa'u al-ansar. Lam yakun yamna'u hunna al-haya'u an yatafaqahna fi al-deen. She said, How wonderful are the women of the Ansar. They do not allow their haya to stop them from learning their religion. And this tells us something really nice. It tells us that men and women are required to have haya. Because Aisha mentioned the haya of the woman. But not only women, the Prophet ﷺ had the most haya of any person. The most shyness and modesty of any person. He was more shy than the virgin bride. And the Prophet ﷺ was very, very shy and very modest. And likewise, women are commanded to have haya. Haya is something beautiful. When Allah Azza wa Jal spoke about the two women who one of them married uh, Musa alayhi salam, that she came temshi ala istihya, walking in a way of shyness. And shyness in a woman is something beautiful. Modesty in a man and in a woman. But modesty and shyness should not prevent you from seeking knowledge in Islam. Seeking knowledge in Islam, there is no shyness when it comes to seeking knowledge in Islam. Or shyness has its place in terms of the way you ask a question, you can ask with shyness, etc. But shyness should never prevent you from knowledge that you need. And this purpose of this gathering today, and inshallah we're going to continue it. We're going to, when we continue it, we have to talk about the hijab, and we have to talk about our behavior towards the way we treat our women folk, and lots of things we have yet to talk about. But what I wanted to explain, what I want to finish on today, is this idea that our women, for them to achieve the paradise that they're striving for, they need to have knowledge. And we need to make a, a very high priority for our sisters in Islam to learn their religion. And if you look at the examples, and perhaps the best example is the example of our mother Aisha radiallahu anha. The Prophet ﷺ said that the superiority of Aisha over the rest of the women is like the superiority of Farid over the rest of food. Farid is like when you have uh, like bread and gravy, something like that, and you mix them together. It's a very beautiful, very, very beautiful and very beneficial food. Why was Aisha superior over the rest of the women? Because of the knowledge that she had. Aisha radiallahu anha, has in terms of the number of hadith, the fourth largest number of hadith out of all of the men and women of the companions. Yani out of all of the men and women of the companions, only three people narrated more hadith than Aisha radiallahu anha. Likewise in fatawa, fatawa, in giving fatawa, in giving verdicts, only three people from the companions issued more verdicts than Aisha. Aisha, she used to give fatawa. She was a big scholar from among the scholars of the companions, from the major scholars of the companions. This is what we want our women to aspire to be. And we have to, to get the most out of our, our, our sisters in Islam and for them to get the most out of themselves. And for us to protect them and us from the evil which comes to us from every direction, from the east and the west. To do this, we have to do it with knowledge. We have to inspire our sisters to learn their religion, like Aisha radiallahu anha did. And there's no doubt that we are suffering a drought and a famine as it relates to women seeking knowledge, sadly. And generally, subhanallah, women were known in the past among the Salaf for seeking knowledge in an amazing, you know, in an amazing way. Especially in ilmul hadith, the science of hadith. 
It was known that women excelled in the science of hadith. I don't know why, but it is a fact that women excelled in the past in the science of hadith. And in many other Islamic sciences. And I'm not saying there are none of them available or around today. There are, they do exist. However, the numbers are much smaller than we would like them to be. We would like to inspire many of our sisters in Islam to become scholars in Islam, to become people of knowledge, to become a resource that the other women go back to. Like Aisha radiallahu anha became a resource that the women would go back to for their fatawa, for their needs, for their questions, for their teaching them their religion. And so this requires a real dedication and effort from both men and women because if you want to help your wife to study Islam, it's not easy. And that means maybe your food will not be cooked exactly as you like it on time every day at the specific schedules that you give and your clothes may not be, you know, like pressed and ironed and whatever and the house may not be whatever you want because ultimately you as a man want to sacrifice some of that to enable your wife uh, to seek knowledge and to encourage your, for the members of your family to seek knowledge. And that has to be cooperation between the men and the women. Uh, and we'll talk more about that inshallah next time. But I just wanted to finish on the conclusion of the importance of seeking knowledge and the importance of not allowing uh, womenly qualities like shyness and modesty, uh, those good qualities, not allowing those to prevent a woman from learning her religion and for a woman to strive with everything she can to learn her religion and only then will she be protected by the help of Allah from these, this huge sort of surge of attacks, ideological attacks against women uh, who want to practice their faith. Uh, and I'm sure you guys know that in terms of conversions to Islam, there are significantly more women who convert to Islam than men. And I think you guys know that yani, generally. And, and this is true all over the world. Even in Kalima, the statistics are the same. The number of women who come to become Muslim are much more than the number of men. So there are plenty of women who see the virtue of Islam. We have to also allow our own women, our own sisters, our own mothers, our daughters, our wives to see that virtue as well and to embrace it and to practice it to the best of their ability. So inshallah, I think that is all we have time for today and we'll do a second part and we'll talk in that part about the, the things that I, that I missed up to now uh, or the things that I did not talk about up to now. So we'll leave it there inshallah. I'm not going to have a massive amount of time today for questions, maybe just one or two inshallah on the way out. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayka.